Welcome to Censored. I'm Aoife Vrithnach, still trying to wreck my head by reading everything banned in Ireland. Check out the show notes for how to support this slightly unhinged endeavour. I don't think I'll read all 12,000 publications, but let's see how far we get. This episode features Nightingale Wood by Stella Gibbons. It was published in 1938, six years after her smash hit Cold Comfort Farm, which was also banned in Ireland. I've already read that one. Check out the links in the show notes if you want to listen back. While Cold Comfort Farm was popular enough to stay in print, this particular novel fell out of favour until recently. It takes a satirical look at romance among the middle classes of a comfortably off southern part of England. Now what I'm going to give you is a very quick summary because there are a lot of characters in it. The story is set in Sybil Peldon, which is a small village in Essex. But actually it's probably more accurate to say it's in the hinterland of the village because that's where all the houses are. There are three households, the Withers, the Springs and the Cakers. Most of the novel is set in the Withers' house, the Eagles, an imposing but grim place. The Wither family are composed of the chilly Mr. Wither, his wife and his two unmarried daughters, Tina and Madge. Also living with them is Viola, Mr. Wither's widowed and poor daughter-in-law. The Springs are then the next most important household. They live in a gloriously comfortable, fashionable mansion called Grasmere, where the parties are fabulous and the maids are beautiful. The Spring family are Mrs. Spring, the matriarch, her son, the handsome Victor, and her niece, Hetty. At the opening of the novel, they expect to welcome Phyllis as Victor's wife. At some stage, though, whenever they can be arsed to commit to marriage. The second house belongs to Mrs. Caker, a washerwoman whose son, Saxon, works as a chauffeur for the Withers. So the novel is all about how these three households do or don't overlap, and who falls in love with whom. Superficially, this does not seem like a bannable book, but then I thought that about Cold Comfort Farm, and I was very wrong. Joining me today is Dr. Laura Ludkey, who teaches in the University of Oxford. She also co-hosts Lit Sci Pod, the literature and science podcast, so check that out. So, Laura, I do normally start with a accompanying beverage to go with the book. And as I was reading this, I started to think that possibly tea was the best choice. There are a lot of really awkward, like painfully awkward breakfasts where people are silently drinking tea. And then there's a very memorable afternoon tea where everything gets blown away. And so I thought tea would also fit the very Englishness of it. So if I'm going to have tea, I'm going to have it like the hermit which is a cup of tea with half a bottle of milk in it and four lumps of sugar. But I, I thought I might propose two alternate drinks for people listening to this in the evening. First, we could have some champagne, as Mr. Spurry and Saxon do when they drive up to the River Chess and they're sat over top of it drinking drinking champagne together in not at all a seductive scene. No, not at all. No, no. <laughs> so we have champagne on the the one hand, but then towards the end of the novel, you know, other drinks are introduced and then we have Guinness and Dewar's, which is, you know, the drinks of choice for the dejected communist coterie to which Donat Mulqueen belongs. How these people drink. It's true that there is a lot more alcohol as the book goes on, as the kind of universe of the characters expands. Did you find that reading the novel drove you to drink? <laughs> Not quite, but I have to say it wasn't the most exciting novel I've ever read. There was a point at which it kind of induced that certain sweet boredom from reading a slow book where it's, you look up and you realise the world has moved on and you've been walking at an extremely slow mental pace through a book. I had a very similar experience. And at one point I thought, gosh, I'm not going to have a lot to say. You know, I hope something interesting happens. But throughout... Even the slow beginnings of the novel, maybe even say to the first third, there are these gorgeous descriptions of the countryside and of nature and of, of time passing that did keep me going. 
yeah, it's quite sweet. It's not very gripping, I suppose, but I definitely enjoyed it more. And when I went back through it again, just of a quick look, I sort of realised I had enjoyed it quite a lot, I think. It improved on second reading. Which most reviewers on Goodreads did not even get through the first reading. Well, if you have read Cold Comfort Farm and loved it, this is not that zesty, zippy, hilarious novel that that is. So it was reviewed in Country Life in April 1938. And of course, it has to be reviewed in Country Life because it's a country novel in many respects. And the reviewer noted it for its constancy and quality and good construction as a novel. That is horribly worthy. <laughs> Ticks all the boxes. Oh no, dear. None of the reviews I encountered mention any of the tumultuous events that populate the second half of the novel. We'll get to that in a minute. But shall we have a quick look then at, well, the filth, so to speak? And what the censors might have objected to. Because I will admit that I struggled as I was going through the first two chapters. I was like, what? This is, this is just people sitting around in a house. How, where is this going? It couldn't go anywhere. And then I thought possibly the first thing that might have let their little censor senses light up. It was page 106, which is the opening chapter nine. And it said, what a scene of unharnessed libido there was in the courtyard of the Eagles about 11 o'clock that morning. And the setting is Madge, the older sister, has finally been given her heart's desire, a puppy, and is ecstatic. And Tina has finally decided to make her move on the chauffeur Saxon. So I thought that that was kind of, I mean, it's extremely mild, but it's the best I could do. I also chose this section as the alert, alert, there might be something going on. And it, it's so misleading in, in many senses because we're expecting much more, Bill. But it's very libidinal because there are all these unspoken, unconscious desires that's being, that are being unleashed here. You know, the Withers girls, or shall we say gals, as, as Mr. Sperry does, they're about to be fulfilled, possibly. It, they're on the cusp of that. And that's maybe where that desire comes from, that sort of an you know, unfulfilled desire is very sexy. It's really telling that that Madge's true desire is the dog. And throughout the novel, she she is so worried that her father will find the dog in the house. She's more worried about about that intimacy than Tina really is about her intimacy. Yes, that's true. I mean, she is so worried because her father threatens at the very beginning, he more or less says, I'd kill the dog if I find it indoors. And it's so cruel. But he never threatens he never threatens to kill Saxon waste of a good chauffeur. Yes, this is strange. This is an unusual flip of the usual, I suppose, perception of Englishness being, you know, more tolerant of dogs than humans. In this case, it's the opposite. Yeah. So <laughs> there there were some moments before this moment that did kind of set me off thinking about what the censors might be reading for, because they had to read really deep to get to get to anything. So it, in, I think it's chapter after six, Phyllis, also known as Miss Barlow, that's Victor's almost about to be forever fiance, visits Hetty, which is Victor's cousin, in her bedroom and makes a comment about all the books she's reading. But Hetty tells Phil to go to hell and then refers to her as a bitch. And surely that sort of that sort of language would get the censor's heckles up. Yes, and it was so sharp and unexpected. And out of character of the rest of the tone of the book. Yeah, I think that would definitely catch someone's eye. This is a question that I had for you. What would the censors make of the mention of the late D.H. Lawrence? And this is, this is on page 103 in my copy. So it's the, the beautiful man, Victor, thinking about his long-term fiancé, Phil. She got under his skin like a spike of summer grass. He compared her to steel and swore he would not be her mascot admirable antagonism, just what the late D. H. Lawrence, of whom Victor had not heard, would have ordered. I like the idea that he'd not heard of him <laughs> after all those obscenity trials. <laughs> so that that again got my mind to thinking, like, well, what are people reading in, in the novel? Which is always yeah. my question. Well, they do actually not only obviously ban D. H. Lawrence's novels, but anything written about him also shows up. Biographies, because, of course, if you want to write about him, you have to talk about 
the filthy books. Um, and then one final thing I wanted to ask you about is how do the censors feel about books like Salim's Daughters by the German psychologist? That that comes in quite early. Again, it's it's mm. the end of this end of the same chapter as the swear words. Yes. Yeah, I think certainly those sorts of books. I don't think that particular one is on the blacklist, but they ban all biomedical and psychological texts as well that are concerned with sexuality, desire, anything Freudian. They ban Freud naturally. So yes, I think that her reading there and her trying to understand her sexuality and her family relationships through well, modern, up-to-date scientific methods, that would not be appreciated. And this book seems to be Tina's guide to how she's feeling and, and how to unpick the problems of propriety in the novel. When she has the argument with her father, she goes to read the chapter on fathers and daughters. Do you remember this bit? Can I, can I read it? Because it's so good. Yes, please do. Of course, Mr. Wither is not the sort of father the book discusses, And the things it said after a bit at the beginning of the chapter warning you not to be shocked did not seem to have much bearing upon her case. What they warned you against was getting too fond of your father and letting him get too fond of you. And of course, there's no worry about that in the Withers household. Nobody's going to be too fond of anyone there. No. (laughs) So is incest on, on on the sheet, the bingo sheet? You know, it isn't. And it's one of the ones I feel I can't believe I left it off because it has come up more often than you would expect in novels. And it's not that it's happening here, but there's that suggestion. Yes, it is often sort of referenced. It sort of appears on the fringes of people's imagination in novels, more often than you would think, Mm. actually. And what did you think of the hermit, this dirty old man living in the woods, showing people his feet? So I thought he was delightful, but creepy. More towards the creepy end of things. And it's sort of the Shakespearean element coming in. So sort of like the Porter in in Macbeth. But he's also a connection to the Victorian world of the novel. That's sort of a holdover from the previous entry. Connections with Miss Caddy, Mr. Spurry and Mr. Wither, of course, because they used to go to the Empire Promenade at Leicester Square together in the 1880s and 1890s. So there's hints there of this seamy Victorian underbelly. Or even the, the Dove Woods in their infirmary ball. Again, those are all Victorian things. And then the hermit has that connection with late 19th century decadence. You know, he's posing for Whistler and Holman Hunt, allegedly. Although at the end of the novel, they do, there's a card from one of them that he finds in his pocket or something like that, a calling card. And even his nickname for Mr. Wither, who he calls Old Shack Persoir. And I don't know if you noticed this, but it's sort of a, a decrepit version of the French phrase, Shack Persoir, each for themselves. Oh, which is such, it, it unlocks Mr. Wither's char- Mr. Wither character. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I do agree that there is something quite profoundly creepy about him at times. There's even the suggestion that he's kind of about to expose himself or feel people up or there's that the dirty old man in the woods feeling about him, isn't there? Well, and he says, well, don't worry, I'm not interested in you. I think he says that to, to, to Viola when they're talking about their, he wants to see their feet by the fireside or to warm their feet. And that, <laughs> that's just the worst thing they could ever think of doing at that point in the novel. But he... He's, he seems like this vehicle for bringing all of the, maybe not all of the novels, many of the novels, indiscretions out into the open. Sort of like a town crier for scandal. Hear ye, hear ye, they're getting together in the woods. Yeah, and he is in the woods between these two big houses, between the Eagles and, is it Grasmere, that fancy house? Which are sort of lake districty places. It, it was very hard for me at first to pinpoint where it was taking place. Like Grasmere, isn't that isn't that a Wordsworthian place? Ah, oh, you see, I had put it sort of, you know, south of London in vaguely Surrey-ish. I was going to say, do we have a minute to talk about nicknames? Oh, yes. Let's drink names. Um, why, do, why does Shirley call old uh, Mr. Wither Old Therm? Old Therm. Yeah. Because the son who dies, he's called Young Therm. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I couldn't work out why. No. No, I don't know either. Then, yeah, that was... I think he's quite... That whole Saxon's mother and her house and the hermit and like the people who seem to have more interesting 
backstories and richer characterization, I felt were that level of the society, like Saxons level, rather than the posh rich people who seemed a little bit like cardboard cutouts in the sense of they didn't have a lot of depth. They felt more stereotypical. And I think certainly at the end, when Saxon's mother kind of turns into this, you know, rich, rich lush, really, just having parties in her flat and having dodgy men around. I just thought she seemed much more interesting than a lot of the the main characters. Uh, We've also got the Merry Widow, because widows must never, ever, 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 ever be happy ever again. Yeah, I mean, that poor Viola trying to be... Just trying to be her age. I know. This young woman arriving into... It sounds like a mausoleum. I mean, when she arrives, oh, I just felt so sorry for her. Mr. Wither and all his withering comments. The names, other than just the the nicknames, the names are so indicative in a very Dickensian and and maybe even Austinian way. The Withers are their own atmosphere at one point in the novel. I think the narrator even calls them an atmosphere. Victor Spring, you know, he brings new life to the novel. It's so obvious, but also Viola, a sure reference to the Twelfth Night, but really only clearly after she gets that haircut, where she looks at that image of her favorite illustration from her father's copy of Shakespeare and realizes that she has that desire to to be gamay, right? To be sort of androgynous. That's never fully explored, though. Yes, and I suppose that's a reference as well to the hairstyles of the time. The the shingle. Yes, those very, very short haircuts. And one of the things that was really funny, I thought, about the novel actually was how Hetty, who lives over in Grasmere, you know, among the springs in this beautiful, exciting life, sees the eagles gloomy with its awful garden and it's almost like its weather system of misery and thinks, wow, they must be living lives of great richness and drama and conflict. <laughs> like she, she imagines a sort of Proustian inner life. I think at one point she describes the atmosphere as a mixture of Chekhov, Proust and a dash of Austin, which maybe it belies the novel's literary influences. Oh, and there were so many. Like, if you know what to look for, there are a lot of references. Well, what were you looking for? Well, I think having... Reread Cold Comfort Farm again recently, but also because I have read some of the Mary Webb and Poise novels that Cold Comfort Farm riffs off of. That's what I was looking for again, I think. And Saxon, of course, bears great resemblance to, is it Reuben? No, is it not? who's the main character again? Who's the beautiful boy in Cold Comfort Farm? Seth. Oh, yes, the biblical Seth. The absolutely gorgeous, devastatingly handsome Lothario of the local district. So Saxon felt a bit like that, but a much more toned down version because he's not actually shagging anybody. Uh So he isn't, you know, reproducing left, right and centre. So that was, I suppose, what I was looking for most obviously to me. What about you? I was trying to make sense of the novel as I was reading it rather than reading it and then trying to make sense of it. And a bit midway through, I tried to explain it to my husband. He said, oh, it's a bit like a bad take on a Jane Austen novel. You know, the two families and obviously like they're going to get together. But it didn't sit quite right with me. And there's definitely some Austen elements in it. And we, maybe we can circle back to sort of the queer couples I imagined getting together in the novel later, because I think There's some strong narrative drive of expectations there. But it wasn't until I got to the end of the novel that I saw clearly what I thought Gibbons might be trying to do. And that is to write her own version of Winford Holtby's South Riding, the masterpiece that came up posthumously in 1936. That's a bit of a stretch, I realize, because this novel is almost nothing like South Riding in terms of how it weaves together all these different elements of community. But Nightingale Wood has all the elements of South Riding, but none of the sense of community and obligation of one individual to another or the individual to the collective. Right. So it's it's much more about, do you think about the dislocation of these families within the landscape, about how they are not connected, although maybe they should be? I, I think so. And, and you know, the, what happens the, in the novel with, with, with Miss Catty, how she brings Victor and Viola together at the very end, 
should have rallied the whole community around her. Oh, maybe we should have old age pensions. Like that should be the natural result of that. But instead, he feels, Victor feels heartwarmed by the letter and decides maybe I should be with her. And so it becomes about individual desires rather than societal ones, which is fascinating to me because Nightingale Wood is a great anti-capitalist novel. If it doesn't make you hate the worship of money and those who worship it, what would? And that piece with Miss Catty, this, you know, laid off... Relic. Relic of a certain type of customer service. She's laid off from her job after, you know, a whole life working there. 50 years. 50 years and is, you know, has no money, of course, because she's only ever had a paycheck. And I thought that part where Viola writes these letters, I thought it was so Victorian. I was quite astonished, this kind of getting together a subscription for an individual based on this patron trying to solicit money for people. And I think that's a really interesting comparison with South Riding, that kind of moment, because it was so odd when I read it. It was like, what is going on? And they thought, oh, it's just an excuse for them two to get together. It's just a plot device almost. But yeah, I think it, you're right. It could have a lot more to it. I, I don't think it's a completely successful satire, but I just kept thinking about South Riding while reading it because of, I don't know, the dedication to portraying the countryside and looking at the dif- like the decay of the class system in some senses in the, that pre-war period as things are about to change very significantly in the Second World War. And I think this is something that another reviewer picked up on. Charles Marriott reviewed the novel in the Manchester Guardian. And he said, you know, he says it's to the acceptance of the framework of the Victorian novel for the purpose of turning upon it the light of a modern mind that knows about repressions, inhibitions, and complexes. That's how he sort of understands the novel. So he is really seeing that those Victorian elements coming through quite strongly, both I mean, The Hermit and Miss Catty. Yeah, you can really see that, actually. You know, there were a lot of moments in the novel where I made these marginal notes to the effect of, hey, this, this section could be its own Hardy novel. And all of these all of these moments seem to cluster around Saxon and his family. As you said earlier, their class is the most interesting and well-developed in terms of characterization and, and just the sort of the realness of the character. And I know the narrator rejects the idea that it's a realist novel because it's a fairy tale. You know, we get that that hit multiple times. But Saxon's father's death, again, could could be the plot of a hardy novel. You know, a prosperous miller who drank away every penny he earned and was found drowned under his own mill wheel. Yes. I mean, Hardy, how are you? <laughs> yeah. So, you, you know, Saxon's younger sister dies very tragically at a young age. And then there's the domestic violence. Mrs. Caker experiences at the hand of the, the the hermit. But then he's also quite tender towards her. They have that, again, a very hardy in relationship. Yes, yes. And I think that's something that in Cold Comfort Farm, people would see elements of riffing on Hardy. But there it's funny and, and here it's No, it not. isn't really as funny as Cold Comfort Farm, I'm afraid. <laughs> but you can't, you suppose you can't write the same book twice. Return to Cold Comfort Farm? <laughs> well, you mentioned satire because, t- you, you know, it's not as satirical a novel as Cold Comfort Farm, but that doesn't mean there aren't elements of satire. Yes, I think we should talk a bit more about the satire in it because it's much more gentle than fans of Cold Comfort Farm would like. But it it is there, isn't it? I was going to th- mention the episode with the face cream, the night cream. Oh, yes. And all of the different women are going to bed in their own beds and each puts on a thin layer of night cream and it ranges in in, in luxury from Mrs. Spring's 12 and 6 pence a pot to Viola's 2 for 6 pence. What night cream category do you fit into? Where are you in the social scale in terms of how much money do you spend on your cosmetics? Well, and 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 again that takes us back to the anti-capitalist element of of the novel. You know, we get that comment and this is sort of the the narrator coming in it's from chapter 9. 
And the narrator sort of makes this comment, civilization as we know it is corrupt. It may be doomed. There are plenty of omens. Its foundations are rat eaten. Its towers go up unsteadily into lowering clouds where drone the hidden battle planes. There's your planes. Oh, yes. But it can and it does supply its young daughters with luxuries at prices they can afford. No woman need be dowdy or shabbily genteel. Well, she has a few shillings to spend on clothes. She can buy something pretty and cheerful. This may not be much, but it is something. Tomorrow we die, but at least we dance in silver shoes. I really loved that, actually. The transformative power of the dresses that Viola longs for and purchases. The sense that you can improve yourself if you get a nice dress, even if you don't have a lot of money. I mean, she doesn't have a lot of money, but those kind of moments of engagement with consumer culture and material objects. And on the other end, we have Mr. Wither. And again, I think this is quite satirical about capitalism. Everything must be saved. Every penny must be monitored. But the investments are going like a roller coaster in the in the lead up to the, the, the garden party that he decides to have. They're high, they're low, they're high, they're low. He keeps being very stressed about it. But money is the only thing that he can relate to. But he doesn't want women spending any money. That would be the worst. He loves money and apparently takes great joy out of it, but yet it makes him intensely miserable. <laughs> That's love. <laughs> My favourite satire actually is towards the end when Hetty leaves to go live her rich artistic life among the Bohemians of London. And she's completely miserable, but loves it at the same time. <laughs> She's so happy. Because yeah. her boyfriend drinks too much and cheats on her and is a great unrealized genius, but is absolutely a horrible person to her. I, I love that part, particularly, again, because of the narrative intervention, that she was the only one who was truly capable of, be, of, of being fulfilled. And you have, to, you have to do mental gymnastics to get to where the fulfillment is, but there's no possibility that Tina could ever be fulfilled or Madge or Viola. So you should long for artistic ennui and despair in a garret in London and no money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that might be the case. There were some satirical references, I think, maybe to something like the wasteland. And this is when Victor arrives in his great Bentley where he, he's coming back to Sybil Peldon. And it's it's a moment sort of, if you can remember in the wasteland, there is the sound of the car horn and it's bringing Mr. Porter to Diana and her daughters. Yeah, it's, it's bringing, it's bringing the, the car to Mrs. Porter, like the horn brings the hunters to Diana. And he is dashing homeward through the darkened lanes, like the horn of a prince who came to awaken the sleeping beauty, it sounded a thrilling, imperious call glowing through the twilight wood. And that, to me, is the first sort of reference of fairy tales, very obliquely, is the sleeping beauty, the prince. Later, we get the Cinderella moment where she has to go home at midnight because the, the withers think it is inappropriate for her to have danced to the Merry Widow. <laughs> uh, but but where, what other fairy tales elements did you, did you find in it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, Cinderella, obviously, just it jumps off the page, really, this poor relation coming in and two sisters. So that was the most obvious. I wonder when you reference something like The Wasteland, do you think that although the fairy tale elements are obvious to any reader who's familiar with like Western culture, do you think that all of those references to The Wasteland and Hardy and other works. Do you think that that makes it a, a better reading experience if you know those? Do you think it feels like a richer text? I think, you know, there's going to be readers who are ignorant of D.H. Lawrence, happily so, and can enjoy this as it is. But the level of intrusion from the narrator that's constantly redirecting us and, and it, introducing these comparisons with other texts suggests to me that we're being pushed to enjoy it more if we've read more. So it's written from a, a very readerly perspective, a very self-conscious readerly perspective. I do think so. And it, it's introduced really early on. I think it's in the very first chapter when the narrator intrudes and says, the gentle reader is no doubt wondering why on earth anyone should have married Mr. Wither. 
And, and you know, gentle reader. Well, where do we get gentle reader? That brings in maybe an element of Wuthering, not Wuthering Heights, of Jane Eyre. And of course, all of the narrative intrusions in Middlemarch, right? So, so I, I think there are some clues that we should be readers, attentive readers, gentle readers, knowing readers. Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, of course, the censors don't like that either because, you know, you're not supposed to have a rich reading life. You're supposed to read to improve your morality rather than get in-jokes. So I wondered what you thought of this moment and it happens, oh, let me see what chapter. Because again, I started reading this as a, the great anti-capitalist novel of the 1930s. So I, I can't but help see that everywhere. So this is the opening of chapter 20. And they're assembled at the Eagles in the drawing room, that boring hour between the tea and dinner. And it goes, it was a tranquil scene. It would have annoyed a communist. And we don't know the communists are coming. The communists are coming, but we don't know that yet. Five non-productive members of the bourgeoisie sat in a room as large as a small hall, each breathing more air, warmed by more fire and getting more delight and comfort for the pictures and furniture than was strictly necessary. In the kitchen underneath them, three members of the working class swinked ignobly at getting their dinner, bought with money from invested capital. But perhaps this is not a very interesting way of regarding poor Mr. Wither and the rest. But yet they are, of course, so entirely miserable that you're like, what difference does it make? You don't feel like you should be jealous of them in any way. <laughs> but we've just devoted 250 pages to these waste of space bourgeoisie. And they are thoroughly unattractive. <laughs> but so unattractive, I think, that you don't even really like care enough to want to burn their house down and steal their money. You know, if you want to foment revolution. I think it's quite, it's quite a mannered take on their bourgeoisie status rather than any, you know, an urgent call to dethrone them. <laughs> so it, it does kind of mark a tonal turn in the no that, that point in the novel. And then suddenly there's a cal cavalcade of events after nothing happening for so long. How did you reckon with that? Yeah, I, I thought it was quite a relief that something was finally happening. But I did feel slightly overwhelmed. There's a fire. The eagles burns down. <laughs> Completely burns down. But they're going, don't worry, they will rebuild it like an eagle from the ashes. Yeah, like it was exactly before. Yay. Because that's precisely what we need. <laughs> More grim I mean, houses. Hetty comes of age and suddenly we discover she has a socialist communist aunt and uncle who are booksellers. And of course, as a bookworm, this is you know, her dream come true. Not only that, they happen to know her favorite poet. <laughs> um, is it, it Don, Don, Donat Mulqueen? I yeah, I mean, they, they just arrive on her coming of age party and it turns out her relations have been hiding them the whole time because they're so inappropriate and lower class. And Well, one's a Fabian and the other's a librarian. <laughs> And they are the opposite of the lives that the springs want to leave in their beautiful lead in their beautiful houses. So that was a bit okay, right? And so she leaves. <laughs> but but Aunt Rose has some opinions. Yes, it is made clear that Hetty isn't going to meet, you know, everyone who thinks like her, and that she will possibly have some conflict. But I think she's looking forward to it, <laughs> you know, after years of hiding her opinions. She's going, going to go to a place where she can willingly and happily fight with people. And I think she's going to experience that as a great liberation. I think she does. This is an interesting commentary on why you should fight more with your family. I think the whole novel is driving the conflict between sort of occlusion and transparency. What if we just said how we felt? Should we get what we desire? Should, should we be so bold as, as to think it to ourselves. Yes, because Tina's whole thing with Saxon is, should she desire him? And then should she express that desire? It's a series of stages in which she moves forward with her uh, ability to express that desire, isn't it? And what does that desire look like? It's friendship that she comes to is she wants a friendship with him. Of course, also a friendship with sex. Yes. Although at the beginning, she isn't really that hung up on sex with him. She's like, just sitting next to him is, a, is enough. And it's quite poignant, that stage of attraction where she's in, where 
just being with him is enough and there isn't any sense of angst or jealousy or very strong desire with all of those negative connotations. And really interestingly, they shift from what the novel calls romantic love to, to married, married love, which must be a reference to the, the text of the same title. Oh, yes, because Mary Stokes does get a reference, doesn't she? Yes, with her first name. Did you did you pick up on that? It's the only thing women can do. Vote, marry, but Marie. And any reference to Mary Stopes is anathema to the censors because they banned absolutely everything she ever published. And suppression of her publications and her ideas are central to the, the goal. So even that little intertextual reference, I think, that would have certainly, you know, set set alarm bells going. Well, and of course, we have Phil, who is very into family planning. She plans to have no family. Yes. There is a lot about modernity and those kind of self-conscious, self-consciously modern, up-to-date ideas, isn't there? Absolutely. I, I found it a novel that sort of shot through with modernity rather than it just being a model, a novel of modernity. It's that interplay between the old and the new. Even someone like Saxon, he has these deep roots, Saxon, Anglo-Saxon. I think it's meant, you're meant to think of this mythic past of him. He's quite modern in many ways, although he doesn't, he doesn't want Tina to work. So then we have that contradiction where he respects her as a human being and, and is completely devoted to her, but the patriarchy is still there. Yeah, there are those push and pull moments, aren't they? In, like, even if we talk about desire, there is that, once again, that kind of disquisition to the reader about flirting. And, you know, how psychiatrists and psychology now says that flirting is, you know, passe. You should just express your desires and book a room in the three feathers and get it over with. Oh, we need to talk about the various queer couples that popped up. Yes. (laughs) So let me see. Obviously, at the very end, not to spoil the plot for anybody, but Saxon goes to work for a very rich man. Mr. Withers' boyhood friend. And isn't he, is he Mr. Withers? Does he help him with his investments or does he just depress him about his investments regularly? Probably both. (laughs) Yes. So Saxon goes to London to work for this man and it's all very successful. And then there is that moment where they drink the champagne, isn't there? I wrote at the top of the page, romance scene. It's... It's actually a really gorgeous scene. You get the sense that Mr. Spurry knows that people don't really like him. He's a bit unnatural and he puts them off. But Saxon seems to be able to get on with him. And there's also a few hints throughout the novel that maybe Mr. Spurry has different inclinations than the other men in the novel. There's a hint that when he and Mr. Wither used to go to the Empire Promenade, they'd, you know, get ready to go out. And I, this is the promenade in front of the Empire Theatre at Leicester Square, where everyone was, you know, being seen in their great decadent outfits. But he was, would always run off and go home. Hmm. Perhaps because he wasn't performing the right sort of masculinity, I'm not sure. But there's this breaking down of that formal relationship between Saxon and Mr. Spurry. He forgets to call Mr. Spurry, sir. And then, you know, the excitement of the luncheon with the foie gras sandwiches and a good brand of champagne. And Saxon says, we. Oui. <laughs> Last time it was only sparkling muscatel. We're getting on. Getting on how? <laughs> yeah. That is a, a lovely scene. It, it, the countryside and that sense of freedom that they've had from being in the car and this beautiful picnic. I mean, it's very lush. So is, do we think that Mr. Spurry is seducing his employee or is it just a nice moment? I mean, to some extent, I thought Saxon was seducing Mr. Spurry quite a lot in the lead up to that. As in, he is very aware of how to please him and makes a very conscious effort, not just out of, I need a job and I need to keep a job, but there is something kind of human in that. He's 
trying to be nice and he feels like he wants to cultivate a relationship with Mr. Spurry, I think. Is that is that just what a good servant does? Knowing your master's every whim, every desire, indulging them. Or is it more? I think it's a very fine line because Saxon himself is is a hard character to decide what he's trying to do. He can be quite ambivalent. I, I, I definitely felt like there was seduction going on. And at the very at the very end, just before Mr. Spurry dies, Saxon is summoned to his deathbed because of this proximity. There's lots of implications that come out of this about what sort of relationship they had. But he's very clear. He says, it's all right, Dad, don't you worry. And Saxon, mm. Saxon I think, is very careful there to draw the line back. Yes. You, you, you don't call someone you've tried to seduce, or, or maybe you do, Dad. And after he dies, of course, there is... It is the will, and it, Saxon receives a huge bequest. And the talk is, of course, like Saxon is very conscious that people will say that he... The lawyers are saying it. Yes, yes. So it is deeply suspicious and is framed as, as a relationship, as a sexual and emotional relationship between the two men, isn't it? I did find that the most interesting. I think there, for me, there were other possible queer coupledoms. And right from the outset, I thought if only Tina and Hetty could meet, they would get on so well in, in so many respects. I was, I was shipping them very early on, hoping that this would be a, a very queer novel, not, not because it had to be. It, it, it wouldn't be necessarily a more interesting novel, but it might have been more enjoyable. But there are all sorts of sexualities going on here because we have Madge who is aesthetic, like possibly asexual. Yes, and is framed as a woman who is maybe very close to the boys, as in almost like a boy. She plays golf. She much prefers the masculine way of speaking about emotions and dealing with their emotional relationships. And she likes backslapping. Yes, I, I thought about the back, the backslapping. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. The backslapping. She's very... I mean, she does seem to have a crush on Hugh, who dies in India. Um, but is that crush seems to have grown out of a very male environment. It's rather, rather, rather than heterosexual in any way. And I, I found Madge very interesting because for a, a novel of the 1930s, which is a politically interesting time in Britain, she seems to concentrate the classism, the racism, the misogyny of the era all within her. She's the most concerned about the family's propriety, even more than her parents. What will people think? And she's not in it very much. She's quite a peripheral character. I thought she would be much more central, seeing as she's part of the opening dynamics, but she sort of fades away. I mean, I did, I, to, to sort of go back to our thinking about how Madge might identify, she does call her dog Polo. It is possibly the most Madge name one could conceive of for a dog. And I love that Polo saves them all from the fire, but then she has to hide the fact that Polo was in the house. And a ruse, a, a ruse must be got up to go back into the house to try and rescue things. Were you sad to see the eagles burn down? No, not at all. No. <laughs> I mean... I was only sad that Mr. Witcher, Mr. Wither, not Mr. Witcher, that Mr. Wither survived. Yeah. <laughs> Thought it would have been quite good. <laughs> and he died. We could have had a funeral as well as a wedding. It would have liberated everyone, if not financially, at least in terms of his minute control and oversight of all their finances. Yeah, he sounds like just the worst controlling, horrible person. I suppose in the context of the capitalism, that is the the patriarchal familial capitalism that so many people are familiar with, that one person has control over the purse strings. Yeah, horrible. <laughs> politics is a very important thing to the censors. The politics of this novel, as perhaps, as I say, anti-capitalist, there are other events that are going on that get really brief mentions, but I think really underpin 
what's what's why characters are anxious in the novel. And this happens, there's just one, it's one sentence and it's about Mr. Spurry and, and the things that he knows about that come to impact investment. It's in chapter seven and it's from the narrator's perspective, but we have for, for, for people under 40 might laugh ringingly at the shocking things heard by Mr. Spurry about Abyssinia, about the means test, about Hitler and Mussolini and armaments and fascism about abdication in Spain and the special areas in air defense. In the end, these very scoffers had to recall one morning on seeing the newspaper placards or opening their own journal that Mr. Spurry had been right. Shocking. So shocking. So we have just one sentence. All of the major events of the 1930s just smooshed in there. The abdication. That's what's happening as this is being written and it's mentioned maybe twice. Yeah, it's very much a novel where the, the big politics is very far away but yet there are those hints those guns the airplanes is, is it possibly the best novel about the spanish civil war by not mentioning it at all well no they mentioned spain yeah that's an interesting point i mean it certainly isn't known for that is it no no and i wouldn't put a, i wouldn't put it on a reading list for a course about the spanish civil war but when we're thinking about how far do politics penetrate into middle england and middling England. It's about investments in capital and how those are affected. Yes, which of course have such resonance after the Great Depression as well. There must be, even if you say the word investments and stock markets, there must be a residual cultural trauma about that. You know, having come so close to near annihilation, so many people did. So yes, that those kind of dark currents, those darker undercurrents of modernity and the stock markets... They're definitely there. So would any of the politics in the novel, those mentions, but then also the socialism and the communism towards the end, would those have been things the censors would have been very disturbed by? I think anything to do with communism is deeply suspicious. To them? I mean, even ordinary left-wing politics as practiced in England is too strong for the Irish market, so to speak, because one of the first things that they do, they start to ban left-wing newspapers. So Reynolds and various organs of the Labour left in all its iterations in, in England, they are banned in the first two years of the Irish censorship. So there is definitely an attempt to close down any dangerous lefty communism stuff. I mean, personally... I would have banned this novel for the sheer Englishness of it. Is it just too much? As as somebody who is a settler colonial living in England, yes. And what in particular is too much about it? I'm intrigued. I, ha I have to really think about this and how to how to carefully articulate this. For an anti-capitalist novel, there is still a lot of celebration of classism in, in many ways and propriety, even though it's a novel that is interrogating that propriety. You know, there's also a lot of troubling English ideas about womanhood that, for, for me, are particularly English. Right. Women should be like this. Women are like this. Even, even the most revolutionary woman is heady and she just wants to support the great genius who will never do genius. Oh, yes. And that's a bit depressing. It is depressing, but perhaps what's worse is that she really, really enjoys it and that's what she wants. I think that that's, she's not struggling. She's wholeheartedly embracing this help meet role. Yes. And I think, you know, the feminism in the novel goes as far as to say, well, if somebody wants that, they should have that. It's that they can't imagine even living out, except for Madge, living outside of heteronormative relationships. Um, hmm. Yeah. And I, I think of in 1937, my mother's mother was a one room schoolhouse teacher riding through the mountains of Alberta with her single school friends on horseback on the weekends, camping in the middle of nowhere. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that is not envisioned in this particular novel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that's beyond the remit of the novel. I understand that. <laughs> well, I have to say that I found that particular brand of Englishness quite attractive. That's where it gets you. It's so seductive. 
It is so seductive. I mean, having started this project, I've been looking at the sort of things that I read as a child and all of the books that I read and reread to death. You know, a large portion of them were interwar. Are they titles I will have heard of? Well, I mean, I would have read, I would have read Biggles. I read just William, all of the William books. So my childhood reading was really saturated in very English texts. There wasn't a lot of specific novels for children available published by Irish people. And of course, the young adult market, you know, didn't really exist. So I just read a lot of classic English books. The Secret Garden, very, very huge. The Secret Garden. Also, also in Canada, not as much Canadian children's fiction or YA fiction either growing up. Yeah, and... I actually asked my one of my aunts what the day read, you know, because they're born at the end of World War Two. So I said, what did you read? And they read exactly the same books that I read. They had been posted over to them by their aunt in England. So like I actually read the same books as, you know, the generation earlier. And so I think that particular vision of Englishness in literary form, I'm totally comfortable with it in a way that I perhaps should interrogate it more because it's so much part of my, I don't think I even realise. I, I think I've only more more recently been coming to terms with that as I try to explicate why the seductiveness of a particular vision of England is dangerous, even today. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Even today. Well, and so very recently I went to the South Downs and Essex is a long way off from Sussex. They're sort of very, very different places, but I went to what's meant to be the most beautiful village in England. And you see this tiny little village with the thatched roofs. Every, every house has a thatched roof and you're trying to imagine how anyone can afford to live there. And yet you have this deep desire to live there, but also to burn it down at the same time. And you're just stood there you know, looking, the, this used to be the baker's house, but now it's worth several million. I wonder how English people feel about it, because a lot of English people must also feel like burning it down. But how do they resolve that? Because it's theirs. It must be even weirder. I, I, I asked my husband, who is English, although he would identify as British for complex reasons, about that. And he just feels bad for not earning enough money. Oh, wow, really? And he's he, he he's probably as anti-capitalist as I am, but that's how it makes him feel, is you feel bad. Wow. That is, a, that's a cultural burden. <laughs> Who thought we'd get here? <laughs> yeah. Come on, we must do censorship bingo. I'm ready. I've got my, my stamp. Okay. We start as usual with breasts. Characters have them. Are they mentioned? I didn't see any mention, you know, because often that can be a, like a glimpse or a swell. I didn't see anything like that. No, that's a no. Reality is there. The, oh, the, the, the only, the closest you get is that Polo is sleeping in the bottom of Madge's bed and that's not close enough to count, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, that's, that's normal dog ownership behaviour. <laughs> Although that libidinal surge when she gets her dog. Yeah, but no, I don't think so. And then sex work. It gets a mention. Oh, does it? So when uh, Mr. Wither is angry at Tina, before she reveals married, um, he makes a reference to the, the, the sex workers of Piccadilly. Oh, yes. It's just a brief mention. Yeah, it, it counts. Racism. Well, yes. Madge. Yes. Oh, yes. The N-word. Well, it is a novel from the 1930s. I feel like it's just to be expected, unfortunately. So there's there's a mention of Anthea and something to do with drugs at the very end. But I couldn't quite make that out. It's just a sort of throwaway line. And I wondered, yeah, poor Anthea, a very large moat in the ointment, having taken at 40 to lovers, drugs and necromancy. Yeah, that'll do. As long as it's not necrophilia. <laughs> I don't have that on the list. <laughs> you need a better list. No, the list is amazing. The list is brilliant. 
I need a list like about three times as big, but you know, be there too long. Oh, and then definitely politics. Oh yes, too many, not enough. No, yes, too much. Yes, both, both swearing. Well, yes, there is the word bitch. Yep, the B word. Oh, and there's also the implication of the well, possibly the F word. Oh, really? There's that long discussion of the words that they can't say out loud. It's when the hermit is there, and he's trying to describe. Yes. Okay. This is in chapter 20. Kissing and cuddling roared the hermit, your daughter. And then there floated back to the foggy night one last shocking, unmistakable capital W word. It was a word known in his youth to Mr. Wither, but not spoken by him for nearly 40 years. A word which Madge, with reddened ears, had sometimes overheard at the crossroad overheard the crossroads louts tossing backwards and forwards in their coarse wise cracking, a word entirely unknown to Mrs. Wither, a word that Shirley had once or twice coolly used, to the shocked yet giggling Viola, a word lumped with eight or so similar words by Focus, Annie, and Cook as bad words, a word sunk miserably from its once plain natural use and made to drudge as a vivid outcast, a poor stout peasant of a word no longer allowed to be a verb and sometimes a noun but used generally as an adjective or an oath a word slinking below the surface of polite language boorishly resisting the night errantry of certain writers who would willingly restore it to its old homely night uh, kinghood blank what is it oh is that the f word or the c word but the c word doesn't make i don't know you see is this some sort of great elaborate linguistic I, joke see that knightly and peasant mm. thing those appeals to englishness yeah is, you know make me think of cunt sorry yeah i think we're meant to a uh, lots of things are, are meant to be well then i mean that is a long disquisition on not saying an actual dirty word while making everybody go i think it's this i'm thinking it does that count yeah i think that definitely counts we take that for swearing <laughs> brilliant and then infidelity. Yes, because the hermit is married. Oh, yes, he is married, isn't he? I was thinking of Victor and Phil, although they're not really like married. But yeah, cheating. Definitely. And then crime. I didn't see much crime. I don't think so. I mean, the hermit is cast as a sort of a possibly sort of criminal, but in a way that isn't really criminal. One of those strange statutes that just is used to define people as a nuisance rather than actual criminal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. Then we have genitalia. Well, we've got a hint of feet that suggests testicles, but... <laughs> but no. The foot fetish. <laughs> okay, yeah, no. <laughs> Although those, those, you know, when she's reading the book and the psychology, uh, yeah. I, it could be hinted at. Is that enough? But you would have to know that the book hinted. Yeah. So, yeah, possibly not. Yeah, we'll say no. So it mentions, of course, Mari Stopes. Yeah. So we say that. Orgies? <laughs> Alas. Although... I mean, lovers at the end with Anthea does not <laughs> explicitly say orgy. And the Baumers, the Baumers seem to be the type that might go to one. But again, it's not mentioned. Yes, it's not mentioned. And Saxon's mother is definitely entertaining company, but doesn't say that she's entertaining more than one. <laughs> OK, yeah, we can't take that. Sexual assault. The hint that the hermit would if he could. Would if he could. Doesn't seem like he actually has. But yeah, I think we could. The creepy old man vibes are very strong. Yeah. I think we could take it just for vibes. Vibes. Yeah. Extramarital pregnancy. There's discussion. So Tina hints that she might be pregnant to try and shock her family. Again, hints. And then they go, but what would you do? I love that. 
I love that. That like she isn't, but she decides to go all soap opera. I might be. Yeah. Yeah, we'll take that. Masturbation. A last nun. Uh, no. Also, no sex toys. Is the car a sex toy? Is a book a sex toy? Yeah, you see. Feminism. Sadly, yes. <laughs> but also not enough. Yes. It's a pity the women aren't, you know, moving beyond just the vote and... Abortion. Or family planning. I suppose it is a fairy tale, so feminism and fairy tales are often a difficult... And, and Rose, though, in her in her extreme communism, though, might be the most feminist. We don't get a lot of her until the very, very end. So maybe maybe that's where we should be looking, is the spin-off. <laughs> maybe she would have written a spin-off to divorce. So much discussion yeah. of divorce. Yes, definitely. And contraception? Yes. Absolutely. Very stoked. Menstruation. I didn't notice any. I didn't notice anything either. No. Blasphemy. Well, they do say go to hell, and that... Is it seems to be as close as possible mention of hell. That's more in the swearing box, isn't it? Actually, very oddly, it's not a very Christian. There's there's an absence of Christianity in the novel entirely. Yeah, apart from the wedding at the end, when it's which is in a church. That's true. Yeah, I think that's only really just for English village vibes rather than religion. So yeah, I don't think there's any blasphemy. Like you say, very little Christianity. Oral sex. There's no, there's not even talking about sex. Okay. Next one. Graphic violence. It seems to take place off stage. So the beating of Saxon by the hermit. Oh yes. But there's a lot of violent shoving. Do vi does violent shoving count? Not really. I mean... The censors object to violence because it's imitative. So violence against a woman. So the beating of Miss, Mrs. Caker by the hermit. Yeah, that would definitely, that's probably the most visceral of the, the violent moments. Yeah, we could take that. And LGBTQ plus content. Yeah. If only because they specifically say what the rumor is about Mr. Spurry and Saxon. Saxon. Yes, absolutely. I don't have bingo, but I do have a lot of crosses over topics. So how many, how much did it score? 14. I mean, it does not feel like a 14 out of 25. No, but then there's the second half and that really helped. Yes, it's true. It really all does take off towards the end. There's a long, slow build up. As it should be. Would you recommend that people read it? Initially, I was going to say no, but... I found so much to think about in it that I would now say yes. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't have finished it if I didn't have to, I will say. But then I did enjoy it. So it's a very strict, it's an equivocal recommendation. <laughs> and this, this is my problem. Once I've read a novel, I've read it and thus will recommend it because I have already finished it. So it's a sort of book I would put on a syllabus saying, oh, we should really read this because it's quite interesting. It pairs well with South Riding, etc. And then forget the challenges of reading it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't read it again, I think. I think it is not one that I would keep on my shelf and be like, oh, yay, it's a Sunday afternoon and it's raining. I fancy something. I don't think it's that kind of book. No. But a lot more interesting than the readers on Goodreads suggested it could be. But no, I I did enjoy it. I'm glad I, I read I'm it. I'm so pleased that you recommended this. And I presume you picked it because I also like satire. Yes. And not a lot of the novels are satirical. I thought it was worth a shot. Well, and there's so few female satirists of the period. Period. Mm. So, you know, widening our knowledge of, of Gibbons' work is vital. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think it was, I think we did a good job on this one. We definitely found things to talk about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. This has been great fun. Thank you so much for inviting me and for asking all the good questions. Now, that's been two episodes in a row on the 1930s. I think we need a break from the interwar period. Next time, I'm reading The Valley of the Dolls, a 1960s classic that sold shed loads of books. From what I've read so far, 
I'd say it gave the censors a cardiac arrest. So till then, keep your hands clean and your minds filthy.